good for you to be here this morning. It is very good for you to be here this morning. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> Giovanni is back. How's Jen, Giovanni? Good. I'm glad that she's really good. Tuesday, back to work. Welcome, all of you children. You can head out to Children's Church. If you would like to head out to Children's Church, enjoy. Children's Church, they are ready for you back there. Marsha is ready. James is ready. Children's Church is ready. Head on back to Children's Church. Children, it's going to be a great day today. There was a... For those of you that did not get to, to enjoy youth group when I was the youth pastor, <laughs> we had a game that we would play. Wits and Wagers. We'd play this game. It was all just about facts. Just fact, Just the facts. We'd play this game. And, and sometimes on the bottom of the card, before I would give the correct answer, there would be a fun fact. And so I would be about to give the answer, and then I'd say, wait, 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 let me tell you a fun fact. And everyone would be like, no, don't tell us any fun facts, tell us the answer. But I'm going to state, just, Alexander, this is for you if you're watching online. Fun fact. I'm going to say it a fact this morning. I don't know how fun this fact is, but it is, as I've gone through life, I've seen this happen time and time again. As I, and you evaluate it for yourself, as I grow in the Lord, trials, be it in circumstance or with others, will happen. Trials, as I grow with the Lord, Trials, be it with a circumstance that comes upon me externally, or maybe there's others that have come in that the Lord has allowed to come into my life, they happen. They will happen. And if you've gone through life and neither a circumstance or an other has happened to you, praise the Lord, man. I, I rejoice that that hasn't happened. But this is what the Bible says. We talked about it last week, and I'll remind you, because this is what Peter does. He says, I want to remind you this morning. First Peter 4.12, beloved, I love you guys. You're the church of the Most High God, beloved. Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though some strange thing were happening to you. I mean, in my own life, and I don't know if this is true for you, I'm just sharing with you, in my own life, I find that that as trials come, you know, two things happen. There's, there's this like snowball effect that happens in my life. And maybe this has happened to you, but let me just share what happens with me. When these trials come, the first thing that happens usually, you know, I would say over 50% of the time, I'm surprised. The trial comes, that circumstance comes, that other person comes, and, I, and I'm just shocked. What, what, what's, what's happening? It catches me off guard. Have you ever had a trial that's just caught you off guard? You just say, where, where did this come from? What's happening here? Maybe somebody comes into your life and it catches you off guard. They say something to you and it, it just catches you, takes you. What just? What is happening here? I'm surprised by this trial that's come upon me. And then this is the danger. When I become surprised by the trial, I begin to react to the trial. And when I react to the trial... I react in the wrong way. How do I react? I'll give you an example. You know, uh, we have this title insurance. That we're, tr we're trying to get this title insurance, and we're out there getting a title insurance. It's supposed to take two to three weeks. Last Friday was like week eight or nine. It's a trial for me. And I was, honestly, church, I was surprised. I'm just, what, what's going on, man? Is there anything I can do about it? Absolutely not. There's nothing I can do. And so, so how do I start responding? Well, let me share with you. I become impatient. Have you ever become impatient in a trial? I become impatient in a trial. I, I start to lose my patience. I, and when you lose your patience, what happens? You guys know when you lose your patience, you begin to get frustrated. Oh my, you get frustrated. You start to get upset. You start to blame others. None of you guys, you guys are all amazing Christian men and women. No one here has ever blamed others for what has happened, what the Lord is allowing to happen in their life. Nobody has done that. I begin to blame the title company. If only this title company would work harder, man. What are they doing over there? They're having coffee breaks or something. Like, what's happening? It's wrong. 
I'm responding in the wrong way. I was surprised, and my my surprise led to a reaction, and my reaction, when we react, we usually react poorly. How should I respond? What does the Bible say to do? The Bible's very clear. It says, Eli, you need to pray. God is allowing this for a reason. You need to be a man that prays about what God is allowing. You need to wait on the Lord. I mean, this this is a theme throughout Scripture, the idea of the saints of God waiting on the Lord. We talked about it in one of my favorite passages. It's Jim's favorite passage. He always uses it to encourage me. Second Chronicles chapter 20, where uh, it's Jehoshaphat is sitting there. Let's worship God. Let's wait on the Lord. And they don't even have to fight because God does everything. Let's wait on God. And go about your calling. What has God called you to do? Go about, do, continue in your calling as you're waiting on the Lord. So often we think that we need, as we wait, we just stop everything. I'm just going to stop everything and wait. No! What is, just because you're waiting on God does not negate the calling that God has you in. To, whether it be a husband or a wife or a grandparent or a friend or a coworker, the ministry that God's given you will still continue as you wait on God. Wait on the Lord. I mean, whew. It's so interesting now because it feels like in this time as a church that we live in, we feel like we have to, instead of waiting on the Lord, we have to fight. There's battles that we, the Lord needs my help to fight this battle. <laughs> if I could only say something or do something and help the Lord out here. <laughs> oh my. How many times have I got caught up in that? It, you know, I, I start to, it just happened this weekend. I, I, I was confronted with a situation and instead of trying to win people to the Lord, I, I tried to win a fight. How many times have we been, got caught up in that instead of trying to show people Jesus Christ, we start trying to fight and we start trying to, my, my view is better than your view. I'm right. Listen, you better listen. We can't, church, the Lord doesn't need my help. <laughs> the Lord wants to use me to reach hurting people. There are so many hurting people in the world around us. The Lord wants to use me. I have to continue in my calling. And I think it's so interesting to me that as we've begun this building project, what, nine weeks ago, it's been nothing but trial. And the Lord is allowing it. And I want to tell you this morning, the enemy's been allowed to attack. The Lord's allowed the enemy to attack at every turn. Be it individuals or circumstance or whatever has gone on, the Lord's allowed it. And I want to remind you that as we continue down this path of building for the Lord, walking in our calling as a group of believers, the attacks are going to continue. And most likely, if the Bible is in any indication what we're going to learn this morning, the attacks actually increase as we walk in faith. The attacks increase as we continue to walk in faith. The attacks will continue to increase until we quit. And I'm not going to quit because <laughs> I'm standing on my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so be encouraged this morning. Remember, I, as we get into the word this morning, I want to encourage you. Remember, that's why we have this theme. It's separation. The calling to be separate from the world does not mean we are to isolate ourselves from the world. It means we are to have contact meaningful contact with the world around us and yet not be contaminated by that world. We're to, have, we're to have contact for Jesus Christ. We're ambassadors thrown out. We're like the ambassadors that were in Afghanistan having contact with the world that hates them and winning that world for the Lord until we're pulled out. It's a tragedy what's going on in that nation. Last Sunday, I was broken. I did not hear the news until I got... If I had heard that news before church started, man, I would have... I don't know if I would have been able to deliver a message. I was just weeping. I, had, I called up my brother-in-law who served two or three terms in Afghanistan. And I said, are you okay? And he's just... He, he, he's trying to make sense. What did I do over there? Why did my friends die over there? He's trying to make sense of this thing. Yeah, I know we needed to leave Afghanistan. I, that's, but how we did it, man, I don't... My heart breaks for our, our countrymen are, are being beaten. There are Christians we have... You know, who are those West Bentley is trying to get in there and save Christians, man? 
Like that's what's going on in the world. We need to be praying for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are who are trapped in in places that are evil. We got to be broken for these things. We have to have contact with the world without being contaminated. And as Redpath will say, he says, we have to, what is for us must be fought for. There's going to be a battle. There's going to be a trial. There's going to be an other. There's going to be these things that come into our lives. And so the, the question just becomes, how do we fight? Do we go out to win an argument? Is that, is that how I fight? Is that my whole purpose here to win an argument? I'm going to tell you right now, there's no argument for me to win. The Bible is true. I, I, there's no argument for me to win. It's already won at the cross. There's no argument. For, but all of a sudden, I think as a church, we feel like we have to win an argument. There's no argument to win. Jesus, Jesus has paid it all at the cross. His blood takes away our sin. Would you come to him? There's, But there's people to win. There's others out there that need to hear the gospel truth. And we are the ones that God says, I want to use you to spread the gospel. And so how do we fight? If I'm not to go out and win an argument, how do I fight? Nehemiah shares with us this morning how we fight. We're going to see it two times. And so turn in your Bible with me to Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4 is where we are at this morning, and I'm reading out of the ESV this morning. You might have the new, it's okay. I'm reading out of the ESV. This is what Nehemiah shares with us, shares with us this morning, Nehemiah chapter 4. Now when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews, and he said in the presence of his brothers and the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burn ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, yes, what they are building, if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. Sanballat, Tobiah, the army of Samaria, they're not happy with the situation that's going on in their area. In fact, what does the Bible say? They're angry, greatly enraged. I wonder if we see any anger in our culture and society today. I wonder if we see people enraged today. I want to point out two things to you in these first three verses. How does the enemy attack? How does he attack? They jeered at those working. They ridiculed those working. They insulted those who were working for the Lord. You're too weak. You're too insignificant. The work will never be done. God is not with you. You're not equipped for the task. And even if the work gets done, it's not going to last. It's just going to come down. It's not going to happen. It's not going to last. Sad reality is, I mean, we've all been attacked with words. There's every one of us, we understand what it's like to be insulted or ridiculed for for something and we say oh i'm not hurt that doesn't hurt you can (laughs) insult me but it's okay but there's times where those words they hurt the area where we don't let very many people in our hearts there's wounds there that no one can see except the lord there's a wound in our heart that the lord needs to heal i mean Many times it's at this point when these hidden wounds come upon us. You just want to give up. Have you ever felt that? There's a hidden wound in your heart and you just, you want to quit. It's not worth it. I'm putting on a brave front for the people around me, but there's a wound in my soul. I need the Lord to heal. Because only the Lord can heal that wound. And I want to encourage you, man, if you have a wound in your soul this morning that you've not allowed anyone to see, Jesus is the great physician. He can heal you if you would go and lay the burden down at his feet. He wants to heal you. Don't quit. Don't give up. It's too soon to quit. The Lord's not done yet. The Lord's not done with you yet. And I sit there and I hear pastors say that. Don't quit. And then I think in my own head, and maybe you're like me. Well, if I'm not supposed to quit, what am I supposed to do? To understand what we're supposed to do, look at the second thing. Look at this second thing that we so often overlook. There is no logical reason for Sanballat and Tobiah to be angry and enraged. 
They have no reason to be angry and enraged. There's none. There's just some, the Jews who they have nothing to do with are just rebuilding their city that's been destroyed. There's no reason for them to be upset, angry, and enraged. Church, have you gone through a trial in your life when you sit there and you find yourself asking God, why? I don't understand why this is happening. Have you been there? You're in good company. Because so often, why? Why does this happen to me? Why is this person in my life? I've wondered that. I've had those thoughts. Why me? Lord, why now? Why this title company? I find it interesting. A lot of times you go back and you look at the the names of these characters in the Bible. I find it interesting that here, coming against Nehemiah and the people, is a gentleman named Sanballat. And what does his name mean? Sanballat's name literally means bramble bush. He's a bramble bush. But that's not... You have to understand the meaning for the Hebrews in, the, in this idea of bramble bush. The idea of a bramble bush is an enemy in secret. A hidden enemy. Or very literally, a hidden thorn. There's a hidden thorn coming against you. And as soon as I say there's a thorn coming against you, those of you who are Bible scholars, you immediately think there was a gentleman in the Bible who we're in good company with who had a thorn. Paul. The Apostle Paul. He talked about it. He had his own sand ballot. He never tells us what his sand ballot is, but he says, I have a hidden thorn. I have a thorn in the flesh. You can turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10, and it says, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations. A thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that he should leave me. It should leave me. But he said to me, my grace, son, my grace is sufficient for you. So many of us, we need to hear that. Son, daughter, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weakness. I am content with insults. I am content with hardships. I am content with persecutions. I am content with calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I read that. And there's times I'm not content to be insulted. I'm not content to be attacked. I'm not content with persecutions. I fight back. I say something nasty. And before I post it, my wife says, you better delete that. (laughs) But I've said it in my head. Are you content under the persecution that's coming upon the church? Man, Paul Sanballat was there to keep him humble and dependent upon the Lord. There's sand, ballast, there's circumstance and others that come upon our lives to help us to see that we need to be dependent on the Lord to get us through this challenge and trial that we're going through. I mean, we have to look back to Jesus. John Corson says this, I wonder, I wonder what sand ballot the Lord has sent you. Only you can answer that question. Maybe you look at him as a big pain or her as a real problem. But could it be that the person who seems to be poking you or breaking your heart is actually allowed by the Lord to cause you to do what we'll see Nehemiah do, to pray? If so, Satan's tactics will backfire because they will draw you closer to the Lord than you otherwise would have been. The sand ballots in our life, the circumstance, the others in our life are there for a purpose to keep us humble and dependent on the Lord. And when I have that urge in me that I'm going to fight, I'm going to come at you with my words. I need to be dependent. I need to stop. I need to pray. I need to remember that they're hurting people too. We have to respond. I have to respond as Nehemiah did by drawing near to God in prayer. Because look at what Nehemiah does. Here, verse 4, hear, O our God. Let me come to you now. Do you hear, God? We are despised. Turn back their taunt upon their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Woo! 
Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. We have to remember, we have to know that when that attack comes against you, when that trial comes upon you, and here's the key, as long as you are going about the Lord's business, that attack is against the Lord. If you are going about the Lord's business and the attack has come upon you, the trial has come upon you, the other has come upon you, the sand ballot is there, the thorn is there, it's against the Lord. It's not against you. This is what this is what Nehemiah is saying. They're attack they think they're attacking the workers, but the workers are doing the Lord's business. They're attacking you, God. Do you not see this attack that they're coming against you with? Will you not act? Will not the God of all the earth do what is right? So often, the trial comes upon us and we think, oh, they're attacking the Lord. Check yourself first. Because if you're not about the Father's business, they might not be attacking the Lord. They might be attacking you. Because so often, guys, it was, I think it was, who was it? Was it Ed, Ed Taylor, I think he said, we have to, we have to be, people have to come against us for the right reason. It's because we love Jesus Christ and we're about his business. Too often people are coming against us and they have reason to because we're being obnoxious and insulting. And we're not being about our master's business in the way that he would have done it. We're not the hands and feet of Jesus going up to the woman caught in adultery and saying, woman, I forgive you, go and sin no more. We're condemning her. We're the ones, we're the Pharisees throwing rocks to a hurting person. Said Taylor, it's not me, it's just, I, I sit there and I say, man, Lord, they're coming against you. Help me to be about your business. Help me to be doing the things your way in this world that is hurt. There are women out there that are hurting. I mean, that's, it was, it was, uh, Pastor Tony just talking about his community just hurting. And it's not just Pastor Tony's community. It's every community. There's people in our communities. And it might even be in your own home. Are there people hurting in your home? You have to be about the Lord's business, the Lord's way. You're not in your home to win a fight. You're in your home to serve the Lord. That's why he brought you there. Are we serving the Lord where we're at? Guys, uh, they're, he's sitting here saying, they're attacking the workers in Nehemiah, saying they're not attacking the workers, Lord, they're attacking you. Because the workers are about your business. So good. In our trouble, we have to draw near to God. We have to be ones that pray and say, Lord, would you work? Would you continue that work in me? Would you continue that work through me? Would you continue that work in the world all around us? Would you continue that work? Draw near to the Lord. Continue to work and do what is right. Bring the circumstance. Bring the sand ballot. Bring the thorn to the Lord. And say, Lord, I'm going to trust you in this. Help me to draw near to you. And then as we draw near to the Lord in prayer, what are we to do? Verse 6. So we built the wall. And all the wall was joined together to half its height for the people out of mind to work. Keep going. Don't give up. It's hard. Building a wall is not... If I were to sit here and say, let's go build the walls of a city. This little group right here, you guys would be like, no, let's not go build the walls of a city. It's hard work. Nobody wants to build the wall. Everybody wants the wall up. Nobody wants to build it. It's hard work. There's discouragement and trial that can be about the Lord's business. Do what God is calling to you to do. Don't stop working. Don't quit. There should be no quit. Because you're standing on Jesus Christ. If this is what God has called you to do, have the confidence to do it in faith. Walk out and do it in faith. Do what God has called you to do. I mean, what do you think is going to happen when you step out in faith? What do you think is going to happen when these insults and discouragements come against you? What do you think the enemy is going to do? It's just going to roll over, right? When the enemy attacks and we stand on the Lord and we say, I'm not giving in to this attack, the enemy rolls over. Oh, wait. I apologize because that's not what that happens in the text. The enemy attacks harder. When you stand on the Lord, when you do what God's called you to do, when you take that stand for God and the enemy has come against you as you are his minister and ambassador in a lost and hurting world, the enemy just says, oh, I'm not, that guy's an ambassador. There's a beacon of light over there in the world. I'm just going to stop. There's a beacon of light in that home over there. That home is, is, is being consecrated to the Lord. I'm just going to stop attacking that home. The enemy attacks harder. Notice what happens. 
But when, but when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs, the Ammonites, the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were, became very angry and they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem to cause confusion in it. Notice the enemy becomes more numerous. They call their friends. They're like, get over here. There's an issue going on and we got to do something about it. Let's go. And how does the enemy attack the second time? They're no longer insulting. There's now a threat of violence. It's now become personal. <coughs> There's a threat of confusion in the ranks. They want the building to stop. The enemy can only go as far as the Lord allows. And here the Lord is allowing it. We have to be ready for that offensive of the enemy. The fiery darts that come against us. We have to take up the armor of the Holy of God. We have to put on the armor of Christ. We have to have the shield of faith along with every piece of armor for the onslaught that the enemy is coming against. He's attacking harder. And how do we meet the attack? Notice the, notice. Verse nine. We prayed. You want to meet the attack? Pray. We prayed to our God. And now something different too. Set a watch. Set a guard as a protection against them day and night. Watch and pray. When that enemy is coming even harder, you watch for the attack and you pray. You watch and pray. I wonder if those two words have ever happened and occurred anywhere else in the Bible. Watch and pray. Hmm. Seem familiar? Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray. The very words of Jesus Christ there in the garden. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Watch and pray. The attack is coming. Watch and pray. The spirit is willing. The flesh is weak. Watch. Watch and pray. I mean, guys, this is so interesting to me because we know what the spirit would have us do, but often we start to rely on ourselves and we get caught up and we get overcome. Red Path says, have a mind to work. Have a heart to pray. Have an eye to watch. Have a mind to the work that God is calling you to do. Understand what he's calling. Don't stop working in your home. Don't stop working in that sphere that God has placed you in. Your work, your friends, whatever it is. Don't stop working. And then the next is very simple. Don't stop praying. We get so distracted, I think, when it comes time to pray. Have you ever noticed that, like, you say, I got to pray. And then all of a sudden, all these distractions come. If you're anything like me, fight through the distractions. Don't stop praying. Never stop praying. James always had that shirt. Never stop praying. And then don't stop watching. Be aware of what's going on. Don't stop watching. Understand how the enemy is attacking. I love 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. It says this, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan. For we are not ignorant of his designs. We're watching. We're not ignorant of what the enemy is trying to do. We know what Satan is trying to do. He's trying to lie, steal, kill, and destroy. We know. Don't be ignorant. Watch. Watch and see what the enemy is trying to do. Don't be ignorant. And then one of the saddest things happens. Because a lot of us, we've, we see the attacks that come from the outside. We've seen it twice. The greatest attack doesn't come from the outside. The greatest attack comes from in here. There's an internal attack that happens to every one of us. Discouragement, confusion. Verse 10 in Judah, it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There's too much rubble by ourselves. We will not be able to rebuild the wall. Notice it's Judah. The leaders. This is the the line of David, the kings and princes. What hits them? They've taken their eyes off of the Lord and they put it where? The rubble. Look at the rubble. Look at all this. Can't build the Lord. Can't build the wall. We're always going to fail when we take our eyes off of the Lord. I mean, you put your eyes on the situation instead of the Lord, failure is right around the corner. That's, that's what happens. I mean, 
Judah's conclusion is they've taken their eyes off the Lord. They put it on the rubble is what? If you notice, what does it say? It says, we will not be able. So we just break it down. Judah's conclusion is, we are not able. Does that sound familiar to you? Again, Bible scholars, we are not able. We've taken our eyes off the Lord. We're not able to do what God has called us to do. I wonder if we've ever heard this in the Bible before. Who's a, who has a Bible? Turn real quick. Keep your finger right there in Nehemiah. Turn to turn to Numbers chapter 13, verse 31. Numbers chapter 13, verse 31. Somebody read it. I don't have it. With, read it. Numbers 13, 31. What does it say, Gio? But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. We can't. The ESV in the New King James says, we are not able to go up. They get to the edge of the land. The spies go in. We're not able. You have Joshua and Caleb, men of God, running amongst them. It says, wait a minute. God is able. What are we doing? We're on the edge. God is able. Let's go. He's surely given us this land. God is able. We're not able. Reminds me of Peter. He takes his eyes off the Lord, and what does he do, right? He takes his eyes off the Lord, walking on water. Puts it on the wind and the the waves, the storm. We're not able. I'm not able, beginning to sink. He's not able. Discouragement is up. Any of you that have gone through this, discouragement, depression, these, these D words, terrible words, They're attacks of the enemy. They're powerful attacks. McGee says this, this discouragement, this depression that comes upon people, this is the time to be careful because the devil can hurt you most severely from the inside. This is the attack that hurts most severely is that attack on the inside. One of Satan's greatest weapons against God's people is discouragement and the devil uses discouragement in all of our lives. He uses discouragement in all of our lives. We have all been attacked. We might right now be under attack. And if it's not happening right now, we will be attacked in the future with discouragement. It will come. It's one of the enemy's favorite tactics. Bring upon discouragement upon a husband or a wife or a child, a parent, a grandparent. A coworker, a neighbor. It's one of the enemy's favorite attacks. And discouragement is so difficult. The attack, that internal attack is so... Any of you that have gone through those dark nights of the soul, those discouraging moments, those bouts of depression, you know they're so hard. And the... I hate to even bring this up, but the hardest thing discouragement usually doesn't come on its own. The enemy doesn't say, I'm just going to give you a little discouragement and just let that sit for a while. The enemy comes with discouragement, but he also comes another way. Notice right here, these guys are getting discouraged. The, the, they're getting Judah, the leaders are being discouraged. They're giving up the, the work. And it's at this point that the enemy says, it's time for a full court press. We're not just going to sit there with discouragement. We're bringing a full court press on these guys. This is what it says. Verse 11. And our enemy said, they're not even going to know. What's happened to them? Not even going to know. They're not even going to see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. The discouragement is upon these guys. Look at their failing at the task. They're not even going to know what hit them. We're coming. We're going to kill you. At that time, the Jews who lived near them came from all directions and said to us ten times, ideas, they just kept saying it, you must return, get out of Jerusalem, you must return to us, get away, flee, the enemy's coming. (laughs) The enemy's ready to attack, take advantage of the discouragement of the people. The people from the villages, they think, these these people from the villages that aren't part of the work, they come in and they think they're helping. They're like, get out of here, man, because the enemy's coming. You're going to die if you stay. You're you're a dead man if you stay. Get out. They think they're helping. They they believe that they're helping these people. I'm going to tell you right now, all they're doing is adding confusion. 
There's confusion in the ranks. Do we stay? Do we go? All of a sudden, oh, what do we do? I, I don't know. There's guys over here telling me this. There's guys over there telling me that. What am I doing, man? Where am I going? What's going on? There's confusion in the ranks. There's discouragement in the ranks. There's an attack from the outside. They're going to kill everybody. It's game over. You just look at this. We stop right here. It's impossible. This is impossible. I can't stand under this, this pressure. I'm getting out. I'm going to quit. Have you ever been there, man? I've been there. The enemy's gonna win. From a human standpoint, the enemy's gonna win. And yet, one of the best things that I can tell you this morning, the enemy always underestimates the Lord our God. The enemy always underestimates the power of Christ. The enemy always underestimates that calling of the Spirit that still small voice of Jesus speaking his truth into your life. The enemy always underestimates the Lord. Always. There's an underestimation of what God is doing. And so what is Nehemiah? He sees all of this stuff going on. He sees the confusion. He sees the discouragement. He sees the depression. He sees the attack of the enemy right there at the gates. And what does he do? So in the lowest parts of the space... Behind the wall in the open places, I stationed the people by their clans with their swords, their spears, their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of them. Do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. Remember the Lord. Stop for just a minute. Don't be afraid. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Remember the Lord. Take up the fight. Don't be afraid. Look at all this stuff going on. Look at the depression. Look at the, look at the, look at the confusion. Look at the things that are going on. Don't be afraid. Take up the fight. Remember the Lord. He is great and awesome. Remember the Lord. He is great and awesome. Everything, everything is falling apart in Jerusalem. And Nehemiah gets out there in front of the people and says, don't be afraid. Don't give in to the confusion. Don't give in to the discouragement. Put your eyes back on the Lord. Remember the Lord, great and awesome. Everything's falling apart. And he tells the leaders, he tells the people, he tells everybody, stop and look up. Don't look out there at the enemy. Don't look over here at these people coming in amongst us and telling us to give up. Don't look at those. Look up. Look at the Lord. Our Lord is great and awesome. Remember the Lord. Is the enemy attacking? Remember the Lord. Remember God. What is he saying when he's saying, remember the Lord? Have you faced the trial of discouragement? I think every one of us, if we're honest with ourselves, we've faced a time of discouragement in our life. It's not fun. How do we get through? We pray. We draw, near to the, we draw near to God and we remember the Lord. I think it was, it was Josh at the men's class. <laughs> Josh like, what, me at the men's class? What was the victory? What was the victory in your life that you've seen the Lord accomplish? What was it? When I sit there and I say, remember the Lord, what do you think of? What, how has the Lord shown himself mighty on your behalf? When you remember the Lord in your own life and in your own walk, in your own journey with God, what is it? If there was one thing that you could sit there and you could bring to mind in your own heart, how do you remember the Lord? How has he shown yourself mighty on your behalf? Ten words or less. Some of us, we could give page upon page and and story upon story of how the Lord has shown himself mighty on our behalf. The Lord is great and awesome. What has he done in your life? Remember the Lord. What victories has the Lord brought about in your own life? Remember the Lord. Because when we look back and we see the faithfulness and the steadfast love of God, we have confidence in our present and in our future that the Lord will continue to be faithful and steadfast in everything that we go through. Remember the Lord. What is it? What is that one thing? Let me share with you. We have a little bit of time. I'm going to open up for a little response from you guys. Because we need to be encouraged. It's, it's a crazy day in which we live. Think of 10 words. Can you put a victory of the Lord in 10 words or less? And let me give you an example. 
You want to remember? You want to know what I think of when I want to remember the Lord? The Lord healed my daughter. That's it. I remember the Lord. What is God, how has God shown himself mighty in your life? What is that one thing that God has done in you? And you can sit back and say, remember the Lord. What has he done? One thing. Who wants to share? Ten words or less. <coughs> <laughs> it's a gift from God. Remember the Lord. Testify. Tell me. Tell us. Encourage us. Go for it, Mr. Chris. The Lord stopped me from committing suicide. Remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. If you couldn't hear him, he said, God's forgiveness was deeper than his sin. Remember the Lord. Who got it? God gave me a beautiful wife that has the gift of mercy. Boy, do I need it. <laughs> Remember the Lord. <laughs> Gio. Uh, I have a job that I really enjoy. Remember the Lord. You, 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 if My grandfather always told me, guys, and for those of you that have grandfathers, you might remember this. If you get a job that you love, you never work a day in your life. <laughs> and I don't know, my grandfather was an accountant. I don't know how you can love that job and never work a day in your life. I don't, I, that doesn't work in my brain, I just, I just tell you. Remember the Lord. Who else? Yeah. The only place in the Bible that God says challenges me is on tithing. He had me tithe, he took me out of debt. Prosper. Remember the Lord. Amen. Remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. Give, he's our peace and comfort. The God of all peace and comfort. Remember the Lord. Isn't that a song? In the garden, he walks with me, talks with me. Remember the Lord. Who else? Pastor Clay. I remember I asked for Lisa and the Lord gave her to me. <laughs> <laughs> Victory! <laughs> hey, there's a lot of there's a lot of things about spouses up here. Up here. Remember the Lord. <laughs> Hey, our, our, our wives and husbands are a gift from God. Josiah. There you go. Church family, we have brothers and sisters all around us. Remember the Lord. We're part of something bigger than ourselves. I love it, Josiah. Thank you. Remember the Lord. Anybody else have want to share? Anybody? Yep. Dan. Hey, the joy of the Lord. We're going to see that in Nehemiah. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Remember the Lord. Kiko. I, I remember one day when I was uh, surfing at Sunset and I saw the hugest, hugest like, shark I've ever seen in my life. It was kind of towards me, like, it was ready. It had like this distance from here to where you are. And it just like changed its direction. It was probably like a pick of food or something. So I'm Remember the Lord. <laughs> Remember the Lord. Anybody else want to share? Don't be don't be ashamed. We're family. Anybody else? You got three? Yeah. Share. I think, you 
you know, when remember the Lord. When we when we buried my my grandfather, my dad said probably one of the hardest things is to bear not to bury a, a dad, but to bury a child. Because we understand it's it's not right. Death is abnormal. It's not the way things are meant to be. But praise the Lord that that He's in heaven, and one day those tears get wiped away. Right? We know the end of the story. Remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. Anybody else need to need to just testify this morning? We've had quite a few. Anybody else? Just before we finish by worshiping God. I almost want to share for you, Doc. <laughs> Doc almost died in Nepal. And God changed his heart. He's a different man today. That's Jesus. Remember the Lord. I just have one. Only, <clears throat> only Jesus can satisfy your soul. Yep. Amen. Jesus. Remember the Lord. Only Jesus. I think one of the pastors yesterday was talking about that. It's only Jesus that satisfies. It might have been Tony Clark just saying the world is chasing after all kinds of emptiness and they're going to find it's empty. Only Jesus. Remember the Lord. And this is the rally cry, right, of the church. This is the rally cry for Nehemiah. He's just showing us, man, the enemy's going to come. Don't be surprised. He comes. We know. In this, in this life, there's going to be trials and tribulations. Be of good heart. Be of good heart. Jesus says, I've overcome overcome the world greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world yeah we're going to have those dark nights of the soul and i want to encourage you if you've gone through one or going through one go right back here remember the lord who is great and awesome keep going keep setting that example for for us you guys are an example for me i am encouraged when i hear these stories of what god does in your lives an example for me your example for other other people for your families and friends remember the Lord that he's doing a work and his work once he does it nobody can stop it remember the Lord father we thank you for this morning we thank you for your word we thank you Lord for testimony that we can share life in common that we can hear what about your greatness about how awesome you are just by listening to the, to the testimony of our lives, of the lives of our brothers and sisters in Christ, remember, we want to remember you. And so, Lord, would you continue your work in us? Lord, I pray a special prayer this morning. I know, I know there's attacks on the outside. And Lord, I know you've given us your peace and you've given us that ability to draw near to you. And those attacks on the outside, Lord, a lot of times it's easy for us as a church to see and come alongside and encourage and build others up. But Lord, I know there's people here this morning and, and people watching online that they're going through this internal attack, this internal struggle, this discouragement. Maybe it's even led to depression, Lord. Lord, I just lift up a prayer for them this morning. Father, I just, I ask that you would draw near to them in their dark night. I pray that you would bring someone into their life, that they would be able to open up to somebody, somebody with compassion that has your spirit. And Lord, that you would use an individual to encourage them today, to speak your truth into their life, or that they would remember that you have the victory and Lord, I've read the end. There's a day you're going to wipe away my tears. That's what it says. I'm going to meet you face to face and you're going to wipe away my tears. And death will be no more. Pain will be, suffering, there'll be no more. They'll be gone. Behold, you make all things new. 
write it down. This is trustworthy that you're going to do it. I don't know the timing. Sometimes I wish the timing were today, but it's not. And so, Lord, as, as we wait on you, as we pray and draw near to you, help us. Fill us with your spirit, Lord. Help us to be about your business, to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Lord, would you plead through me to my family? Would you plead through me to those in my life, Lord, today? So we trust it to you. Remember you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.